Jackson, who is the president of ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, and uh, Andy Briggs from uh, University of Glasgow. ISPOR will be having a meeting in Glasgow this, this fall, so we hope you'll come to see Andy there. He's well, the co-chair, right, Andy? So, so uh, in the last several years, we've had several value frameworks that have come onto the scene in the United States. First, there was a framework by um, uh, the cardiologists and the American Heart Association arguing for the use of the, uh, the uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio in decisions about treatment guidelines. The American Society of Clinical Oncology came out with a framework for shared decision making between clinicians and, phys and patients. Um, Sloan Kettering has a framework called Drug Abacus. Uh, the NCCN, the Comprehensive Cancer Network, has a, a rubric for sort of organizing information to assist in developing guidelines. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, Steve Pearson about the ICER framework that's come onto the scene. So these have come out, and in ISPOR, our professional association in pharmacoeconomics and outcomes research, has set up a special task force, and Dick will be talking about that. I'll just give you a quick overview. So these. The basic issue is these frameworks have come onto the scene. They're, they're, you know, it's not a vacuum. We've had frameworks around for a long time. In fact, the second panel on cost effectiveness had released their report in the fall. There will be a special, uh, special session on that. But we wanted to focus, and this was a, uh, you know, a U.S.-focused effort, even though ISPOR is very much an international organization with 20,000 people in 115 countries. But we wanted to sort of tackle this uh, from U.S., and then we'll build on that, and we presented this material in our international meetings as well. So we really wanted a robust discussion about relevant perspectives and appropriate approaches for thinking about value in a methodologically sound way. So we wanted to identify the key issues, convene a special task force, and then, in, but to have a stakeholder engagement, it was stakeholders being patient groups, industry groups, academics, and others. And actually, our, our report was released last Friday, the second draft report that we have. We're going, this is the last round, hopefully. Uh, and so you're all the stakeholders from our point of view, and if you want to download it, I'll give you the link, and we'd be happy to have your comments on the second draft. This is just a schematic of the, of the, frame, of the time over the last uh, year and a half, I guess, we've, we've been working on this. We had a steering committee. We formed an expert advisory board. Um, we, we bounced it off of, uh, we had a meeting at, with, in September of last year where we presented our, our work plan to, to stakeholders. We have a stakeholder advisory panel. Then we have the special task force. We also had a special call for papers, and we have 25 papers and a special supplement to Value in Health, the ISPOR journal, that speak to a lot of these issues, and they were critical in, in developing the, the final report. We presented it at ISPOR, and we're presenting it here, and, and as I said, we're in, the, we'll have a second, we're in the second draft, so we look forward to comments. Here's a list of the task force. They're not all uh, lifelong members of uh, ISPOR. Many of them are members of uh, AHIA and ASHECON. So, uh, you'll recognize a lot of the names, a very uh, distinguished group. It was a big uh, pleasure for us to convene this group. And I, this is, a, this is the, the sections of the draft white paper that just came out. I'll let Dick talk more about it, but you can see it, it, you, what, it's, uh, it's actually probably 30,000 words, so it's a lot of chapters. Uh, well, he'll probably be focusing on the, uh, the key points and recommendations. And again, you can get a copy of the slides from me on any of these, or, and this is the link to, the, uh, to our framework. But if you just go into Google and type, uh, you know, or, uh, your browser and say value assessment frameworks is poor, you'll get to this link and you can download the report. So each of our speakers was going to have about, is going to have 20 minutes. I'll keep him to that. And then we want to save a good 25 minutes for Q&A. And we'll bring them up here and we can have a, a, hopefully a great discussion. So thank you for coming in. Dick, why don't you come up first then? Well, um, thank you, Lou. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting us and organizing the session. Um, I'd also like to recognize Lou as a, our immediate past president of ISPOR, and uh, of course, Peter, who's in the crowd, is a co-chair of this task force with Lou, uh, past president maybe 10 or so years ago. Your picture's going to be on a dollar bill pretty soon, I think. So um, let me, uh, so j just to sort of Go back to where this started. We had a steering committee that formed the beginning of last year um, that helped us get it started. And in fact, uh, I think Tony Lasasso was also on that, that steering committee from ASHECON to help us. So that, that really helped get it started. And then um, 
Roughly last spring, we put together two groups, an expert advisory board of the uh, more or less health economic outcomes research experts and, uh, and sort of some key, mostly key people in, in uh, either health economics or in the ISPOR sphere. And then separately, a stakeholder advisory panel, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And they helped us understand what we needed to do and what the key issues were. We, we did a couple of surveys of those two groups. And then we formed this special task force, which was really the group that uh, did all the writing, collaborated for the past year or so now. Uh, that group's been together and has produced a second version of, we, we produced a version uh, back in uh, early May that we, of the whole white paper that we uh, sent out to these two expert groups, the expert advisory board and the stakeholder panel, and got comments back. And we've just put, and we, we paid close attention to those comments, revised the white paper, and we've just put out a version for membership review. Um, so, um, and, and let me say one other thing to, to kind of get this rolling is, we know that the second panel recently reported out, if you haven't seen their book, you should. It's just a tremendous uh, volume and, on the, the basics and the key elements of doing cost-effectiveness analysis. And I don't, I, you'll, as, as Lynn indicated, and there'll be another session on this, I think, right after this here. Um, so what we were trying to do, why, why have a bunch of health economists follow up on that effort by some top-notch health economists? Um, well, so we were reacting more to the, the more recent frameworks, which came out, and there are just a variety of them. And I think it was unclear to a lot of people how the different ones fit together, how they should be used. And, and what we think we defined pretty well in this is that there isn't one grand unifying framework that meets all needs, or at least it's really not practical to try to put one together. Theoretically, you maybe you could. But at least in the US, we are defined by the healthcare systems, the insurance plans, and those plans make decisions. And there is a, a, a structure to those decisions that, that needs to be observed elements that are important to those decisions, and those, those just take place. And so we have to pay attention to that. Now, maybe they're not perfect, um, and, and that's a question that, that we tried to explore. Once the insurance it, plan has made its coverage decision and made some pricing decisions, then the patients typically have to make decisions in connection for themselves and in collaboration with their physicians and families and other people that they, they care about. And that's a whole different kind of decision with different elements to it that it's pretty hard to then make this, you know, based on exactly the same elements that the, the coverage decision should be made. But the, the two should be aware of each other. So we tried to distinguish those two key things. And then, knowing that we have a bunch of health economists, we want to think more about the, the population, the plan level decision and what's good about it, what's fundamental about it, and why has there been this big movement lately to look at frameworks, and what is that telling us that's maybe not quite fully complete about the plan level decision? So we wanted to pay more attention to what sort of the society and the market is telling us and what we need to pay more attention to at the plan level. And so we, we try to elaborate on some research directions there. So, um, with that as sort of, this is what you're going to hear, in our survey of the expert advisory board, we wanted to ask, is cost utility analysis, which is sort of our basic health economics framework, is that a value approach, uh, uh, a valid approach? And we basically got, yes, but it's incomplete. And the, the, it's one of various approaches. And that was a good clue for us that Cost utility analysis is a core, for sure, but there's more that could be done to capture other elements of value and, and gave us some suggested alternatives. And that helped define our scope of work for the task force. Um, we also wanted to pay a lot of attention to the stakeholder advisory panel. We put it together and invited about 40 members of some of this poor, many not, and patient reps, payers, provider organizations, and industry, and researchers 
to give us more stakeholder input on what we were thinking about doing. And uh, they, they answered some survey questions as well, and that helped to form our scope of work. Uh, we held a stakeholder conference in D.C. last September on the scope of work, got a lot more input, got some more interest, so we expanded the stakeholder panel because we had decided that we could function best as a st special task force with a really good group of health economists. And, but that was a deliberate decision that it wasn't then going to be composed of everybody from the stakeholder universe, which, you know, was a, a pro and con. We had to make that decision. Given that decision, we wanted to carefully involve a lot of stakeholders in different stages along the way. And so they have reviewed the draft white paper. They got the first shot at it. Um, they did support our overall, uh, overall methodological aim, or overall aim and methodological focus, and generally supported that we needed to look at the payer decision making and then the patient level, the shared decision making as our key priorities. So that, again, guided all this work. They also thought that some other elements that are less common in the standard cost utility approach were important, like severity of disease, modifying valuations in ways that sometimes health state utilities don't perfectly capture, um, things like near-term mortality, value of hope we'll talk about a little bit, um, and of course having input from patients on many of these factors, and especially on how important they are. So uh, as Lou mentioned, we we wanted to get a lot more input as uh, you know, to our thinking from the field, so we did this call for papers, and we got 125 abstracts. And uh, it was a lot bigger than we expected. So we turned it into a themed issue. We invited a, a bunch of people to, uh, to offer uh, to, to, to submit full manuscripts. We peer-reviewed them, ultimately published 22 in a separate issue of Value and Health in February this year. So, to our, to our recommendations, Lou showed you this introduction to the, this, uh, this table of contents, uh, which turned out to be at this stage about 35,000 words. So it's, it was quite a work. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the specific recommendations and um, the, a few of the key things that we brought out in these recommendations that I think would be of more interest to a health economics audience. So, um, the first recommendation is to, and, and a carefully worded recommendation, is to begin with and build upon cost effectiveness analysis for health system allocation decisions. You know, this is, we, there's been no change in the thinking that we have to think about the core elements of uh, what health gain are we getting for the dollar and how do we, in Efficiency is still an important consideration. It's not the only consideration, but in any system with constrained resources, you have to think about that. And um, so we look, you know, we, we say uh, that that focus on health system resource allo allocation decisions should consider health gains as measured by qualities and costs as a starting point to inform payer and policymaker deliberations. Issues beyond costs and qualities should then be considered, and if rel when relevant and if practical. So, there are times and places and situations where, and particularly treatments, where other elements are legitimate aspects of value that uh, should be considered. The and, and we'll get into more detail there. I will. Uh, recommendation two point one. Clarify the importance of pers perspective and decision context. So again, we, this is a reaction to uh, some of the frameworks that are out there where the, the decision context was perhaps not as well defined as it could be, and we especially need the, the stakeholder audience and the general public to understand that there are different purposes for different frameworks, and uh, don't, don't try to mistake one for the other. And this is one, if you were in the session that Lou gave, uh, the, the talk that Lou gave yesterday, you, you probably saw this one. There are, of the, of the five U.S. frameworks that Lou mentioned, and of course there have been many other frameworks and guidelines along the way, and some more recent, 
Um, but uh, the, the ICER framework and the, uh, the uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering framework are, are more at the plan level, and those, those look at coverage and pricing. And then we have the two, um, two of the uh, societal frameworks, the uh, American College of Cardiology and National Cancer Comprehensive Network, are more oriented towards clinical guidelines and how, how a, a specialty society should think about value in the care that it's, it's providing. And then the, uh, at the patient level, the NCCN framework can be used at that level as well, and the, the American Society of Clinical Oncology framework is very much oriented towards its shared decision-making patient-level framework. So, so this is how the, the five that we uh, look most at break out. Um, if you're familiar with the Avalier Faster Cures, they've, they've got a draft framework out now that's very much a patient-level framework. Recommendation 3.1, apply conventional cost-effectiveness analysis to inform public and private coverage and, and reimbursement decision-making. So again, we reiterate that the um, cost per quality metric is still our, our basic starting point. Um, we call it a core component of value assessments to inform public and private coverage and reimbursement decisions in the U.S. And we'll elaborate on that. But we, we are a, a second and a, an important aspect of that recommendation from Section 3 is that we support additional research that enhances the applicability, scope, and relevance of cost effectiveness analysis for decision making. So basically, we're paying attention to what we've been hearing from the public, from the patients, that there are things that are not fully responsive about uh, the basic cost per quality approach. And, and some folks don't like the quality at all. Now, there are some folks that don't want economic valuation to be used at all, and we can't quite go that far. Uh, that's, that's something we have to consider in, in um, constrained resource allocation decisions. But there are ways that the quality could be, could be made better and more responsive to certain values that we understand in society. The second panel came back as part of its recommendation with an impact inventory, and this was more about impacts on the legal system, on the educational system, on the welfare system, other societal impacts for their, their um, societal level, that's what's called reference case, that uh, recognized some of that concern. And, and so we, we, we recognize that too, absolutely, but we build upon that a little bit more from an individual welfare maximization point of view, but also with an equity component. So we want to look at things like insurance value, real option value, value of hope, scientific spillovers, other things that, you know, are valued in, in a, especially in new technologies where these decisions tend to be most, most relevant and most often applied, but frankly, in any type of medical service. We also have to think about the allocation of spending between the health sector and the non-health sector, and are they being made in an efficient way and using the same elements of value. So if you're going to apply something like value of hope, um, not, it applies not just to, to health care decisions, but potentially to some other types of spending decisions. So here's what we have in terms of new elements, the green ones are the standard ones, qualities and net costs. The light blue ones are things that are pretty well known and in terms of productivity, and uh, which is usually a separate factor. And then there's adherence, which if done properly, and it's often not, should just factor right into qualities and costs. Uh, but the, around the, the rest of it are a bunch of newer elements that mostly have been researched. A reduction in uncertainty, fear of contagion, insurance value, severity of disease, value of hope, real option value, equity, and scientific spillovers. And each of these we talk about in, in Section 3. I'll give you a couple examples. There's been work done on value of insurance. Existing estimates suggest that it counts to 40 to 60 percent of the conventional value of morbidity improvements. Very quantitatively significant, worth paying attention to. 
value of hope. So this is the case where, say, a cancer treatment uh, has an asymmetric distribution of outcomes. So instead of a very focused, everybody gets the median survival, maybe there's a long tail and there's cures. So cancer patients want to take a chance on that long survival, that cure, and they'll pay for that over and above the median, median uh, survival. And they'll pay around like $35,000 based on one estimate for each one year increase in the standard deviation of survival. And, um, and other, other research supports that. Real option value, so if, if one treatment can give you, get you an extra year or two, that gives you an option of new treatments coming out in that year or two that could then you know, further improve your survival. And so that's the option value of a, a treatment with, with only a year or two. And that has monetary value, 10% in the non net monetary benefit in one case, 25% in another case. Um, okay, so uh, fourth recommendation, utilize value thresholds expressed in the cost per quality metric, potentially considering other elements. So this gets to decision making. What do you, you know, we, we have the thresholds. And one chapter talks a lot about thresholds and opportunity costs. And it, uh, it also talks about manage, managing budgets, which are a fact of life. And I think Steve will talk more about that. Uh, there are things to consider. So uh, it says uh, take into account adjustment of costs, impact of delaying or staging implementation of new technologies, and cost effectiveness ratios of new and existing technologies. Um, now, Aggregation, how do, you, how do you think about that? There's, there's the basic cost effectiveness, cost utility uh, uh, analysis approaches that we're all familiar with. But that's, that's a tough one to aggregate, aggregate across individuals and, and distributional effects aren't, equity effects aren't accounted for. So there is a fairly new technique and a few variations on how you, how you capture distributional effects. Uh, by Verguet et al., some work by Cookson, some work by Asari et al., um, that measure risk protection, you know, cases of, of bankruptcy avoided, that kind of thing. But they're multi that, that looks across subgroups and it doesn't create just one metric. So our task force has recommended what we call an augmented CDA approach and capturing new value envelopes. But there are ways, different ways to do that. You can do an inventory and not and again, that's multi-dimensional. Multi, uh, you can incorporate some of these into the qualities or costs, not all. But, you know, selected ones could be captured in an ICER-like ratio. But then you've got to worry about changes in the threshold as you add new elements. Um, and finally, you can monetize them all, that monetary benefit. And that's probably the most comprehensive approach. In doing that, you're pretty much in MCDA territory because you're creating a value structure for all these elements. And multi-criteria decision analysis is the approach to that. And it, it's a more flexible approach than a very rigorous health economic framework. But if you want to see one, look at our Appendix 3T that does that. And uh, that's, that's some great work that Darius Lakdawalla led. Um, there are no, there's another. But in general, it's a deliberative process with groups involved and structure and transparency. And these are key elements of any of that process. And that comes out in our fifth recommendation, use and test structured deliberative processes. But we need more work on valuation and on the uh, approaches to transparency. And, and so this is a next step in that area. And finally, we want to encourage users of alternative value assessments to gauge their usefulness in terms of consistency, reliability, and fairness in the broader context of healthcare decision making. So there's no one framework that works for everything. So we've got population level decisions. We, what we want to say, especially as well designed patient level frameworks, need a lot of validation and understanding how they work in different situations. And um, we also want to un want there to be some consistent, some understanding that different elements work in different situations. 
but we also need some consistency. This can't just become a grab bag of elements that can be used whenever you want. And, and that's where some, some real rigorous thinking needs to be done about how to do that. So, last, last slide really. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback. It's out on this white paper. It's out for member feedback right now, all 10,000 of our members. Um, uh, we, the comment period goes to August 4th. If you're an ISPOR member, even if you're not, we'd welcome your comments. And, and there's a link right here. You can find it. Um, we will then revise based on that, and we're, we're uh, working towards publication of it as well. So thank you, and uh, I'm welcome to hand out slides and uh, any other comments. Thank you. All right, hey, good morning, everybody. And thank you, that was actually a, a wonderful intro. Um, there are two kinds of talks. One's a kind of folksy, uh, take it easy talk. One's kind of a blitzkrieg of, of uh, fire hydrant speed information. I'm gonna be a little bit more on the blitzkrieg side, just given the time. But I do wanna start uh, by acknowledging this whole idea of value frameworks must, in some ironic way, seem bogus to a lot of health economists. Because in a sense, the health economists of the world have done the work over decades that are now somehow being called some component of value frameworks or subsumed by them. And certainly, how many of you are from overseas? Yeah, OK. So it, this is almost like the United States, after 20 or 30 years, is finally kind of waking up, smelling the coffee, and saying, ooh, I invented that, right? <laughs> I own that and I'm going to call it what I want. And all of the work that has been going on around, you know, everything, end of life waiting, uh, you know, patient trade off, uh, you know, kind of the work in Norway, all the work in Australia for many, many years, et cetera. All of you have been part of that world. And now it seems like here in the US, we're literally walking back through the same path. So yes, we are. <laughs> we are going to find the same potholes and call them different things. We are going to think that we have new insights that no one has ever thought of before. So mea culpa, and with your uh, forgiveness, I think what's going on in the US is partly that for the first time, uh, value frameworks, cost effectiveness, is getting some teeth in the real world. It's being talked about by federal policymakers. It's being used by private insurers in ways that have never been done before. And you can easily find articles written just a couple years ago that will say that it can never happen in the US. We have a history of not doing this kind of thing. So it's partly because of that shifting and grinding atmosphere that we are talking about things that are old to many of you but new to folks in the US. So I'm going to try to go quickly through the past, present, and future of the ICER framework, again, knowing that we stand on the shoulders of giants. So ICER, don't you love the acronym? This is one crowd where I know that everybody gets the joke. Um, <laughs> so we are an independent, not governmental, uh, in the US. Uh, we do publicly available, nothing's behind a paywall, value assessment reports, not only on drugs, on other things as well, and that's important in many ways. And uh, following in the European and other traditions, we like to convene independent appraisal committees that wrestle with the evidence and in some way either take a vote or add, in a sense, dimensions to the understanding of the information in a way that can draw the public and other stakeholders into the process. And in lieu of a federal uh, agency, ICER has started to uh, be called by many groups the national in the US, uh, you know, drug cost watchdog. Again, even a term that comes almost immediately from the UK, or at least I've seen it the most. So we do have right now three, and we'll have soon more uh, regional independent appraisal committees, one in New England, a six state collaboration, one in California, and one in the Midwest. So. 
briefly, again, I'm going to go kind of fast here. The, our value framework, again, that term, and I'll, I have a kind of a, a man on the street definition at the very la last slide. But basically, ISHRA has been in existence for over 10 years. From day one, we've had a value framework, whether it was implicit or explicit, and it's evolved over time. About th two and a half, three years ago, we did launch a formal, very formal process to try to be more explicit. And we had a work group of decision makers and manufacturers and consumers. We were trying to make it reflect the way that payers in the US think, but that could create a, a framework for common dialogue, especially between manufacturers and payers, but also with patients and clinicians, so that there would be at least some sense of a common language about value um, and that people would have the same idea in their head. We clearly, that's a, that's a tall order, but that's what we tried to do. Where we ended up feeling was that we needed to state a goal that hopefully all stakeholders would share. And that goal, in our words, is sustainable access, if I could say that word, sustainable access to high value care for all patients. Now our value framework splits the, the conceptual entities or, or elements that you would need to achieve that goal into two main domains. One is long-term value for money, and that is a term itself which has evolved in our usage, and the other is short-term affordability, and I'll come back to both of those in some detail. Within long-term value for money, we say that there are four sub-elements. One is comparative clinical effectiveness, which again, partly because we are in the US, but I think for other reasons, we want it to stand by itself. And in our reports, it stands by itself. There's a full systematic review, network meta-analysis of the comparative clinical effectiveness information, and it gets a separate rating all by itself without costs or other things being considered. We do incremental cost effectiveness analysis. And then we have these additional domains that we have called other benefits or disadvantages and contextual considerations. And I'll talk more about those as well. But in many ways, they reflect everything else. <laughs> Some of the things that, you know, that, that Dick was talking about that, that people will want to bring into the conversation that may not have an easy fit within either comparative clinical effectiveness or incremental cost effectiveness. For short-term affordability, we have been doing potential budget impact analyses and including those as part of our value assessment reports. So the way that we also use this in the US context, because again, we're not a national agency that gets handed a price to work with, we have been doing what we call value-based price benchmarks. So when we do our analyses, especially on drugs that have not been launched, um, at or near the time of FDA approval, we use our cost effectiveness to generate a value-based price benchmark using a cost effectiveness range. And then conceptually, we want policymakers to use that and reflect back through the question of whether the value as you would see it through long-term cost effectiveness create some tension, whether there is some tension, given the, the magnitude of use in the shorter term, whether that could create some tension around short-term affordability. So part of what I wanted to, to discuss was the, was the more recent evolution based on public comment. Um, our value framework, again, we've kind of had multiple cycles of informal comment as we've worked with stakeholders through the years and through our independent appraisal committees, which include uh, clinicians, methodologists, and public and patient representatives. So through all of that experience, obviously, things change over time. But we also had two very formal public comment phases on uh, the value framework. We received lots of over 400 pages of public comment on things regarding the types of evidence that we would use, a lot of around procedures, because as you know, any value framework uh, sounds like you're talking about p-values and ICERs. But it, you know, a lot of people want to talk about the process for, for their input and the meeting structures. I'm going to talk mainly, though, given the short time here, on the input and the evolution of our thinking on the quality, on the integration into the value concept of these additional benefits or disadvantages and contextual issues, and on the potential budget impact and affordability. 
So uh, we received a lot of comment that ICER should be using the societal perspective instead of the health system perspective. I don't need to tell you about the challenges of doing a full societal perspective and some of the reasons pro and con there. We have decided to stick with the health system perspective as the primary uh, perspective that we will use in our modeling. Um, we can come back to the reasons, uh, again, why, but I think there are strong arguments for why we would want policymakers to think as broadly as possible. But as you know, once you start down that, it's very hard to decide when to stop. Do you include productivity? That's obvious in a way. Do you include tax receipts? Do you include disability? Do you include education, corrections? It becomes a very difficult minefield of how broadly to scope it. And then when you tell people that for every time we're going to look at productivity, we are going to in some way disadvantage a treatment for the elderly, um, they say, oh, we didn't think of that. We thought it was only an add-on. We thought all these other things were just to, you know, in a sense, create more value, recognize more value. We didn't realize that you would have to take something away from some group to give it to somebody else. So we also uh, received the, the usual comments that the quality is the devil's own offspring and everything else, that there are better ways to do it. Of course, most of the letters that say there's a, you shouldn't do this don't say there's a better way to do it. They just say the quality is limited. You all know and have spent your careers learning about all the flaws or limitations. But it is the core, and I think ISPOR's work uh, reaffirms that, and we certainly do too. Um, some relatively minor, but may seem minor, but very important things is that we have now been able to move beyond looking at the list price of drugs. We are working with a consultancy that is a way, has a way of reverse engineering net prices in the U.S. system. And in the U.S. system, that's critically important because the rebates can be huge sometimes, 30, 40, 50 percent off the list price, and it can vary a lot. So to know that is a key part of coming up with a cost effectiveness model that has some uh, validity. All right, about thresholds. Well, for years we had used 100 to 150,000 per quality. Again, I'm not going to go with, through with you. You know all of the, the opportunity cost versus willingness to pay versus other approaches to this. Um, I will say that politically or strategically, we chose that because it was towards the northern end of the one times three per capita GDP which even though the World Health Organization itself says, oh, please don't use that, you know, <laughs> for other purposes, um, groups have, and it stands out there, and the old 50,000 per quality in the U.S. is old and has lots of detractors. On the other hand, we proposed, in one of our, before one of our public comment phases, to go to a broader 50 to 150 for our pricing, that we would come up with a price range that would have the lower end of the price, you know, value-based price benchmark tagged to 50,000 per quality and the upper one 150 because of a lot of the work coming out of the opportunity cost um, research in England and in other countries. There was another session on that at this meeting. And it continues in my mind to be one of the most uh, important ways to think about uh, a, a threshold in any health system. On the other hand, we also said that we were going to use a modified version of an MCDA around these other benefits and contextual considerations to take that broader range and kind of pin a tail on the donkey. That's a very American uh, uh, children's game. So basically, within that range, we were going to use our independent appraisal committees to vote on these other benefits and contextual considerations that would, in a sense, find the, the spot where we would kind of say, this is the ICER here, given their view, the independent panel's view of these other considerations. I'll talk about why we are not doing that. The final approach is going to stick with 100 to 150. We are actually going to still provide, and we have anyway, but we're going to kind of formally provide uh, the information all the way up to 175 for voting purposes. And that's partly, again, for many reasons, one of which is if you still want to use the three times per capita GDP in the U.S. today, that's closer to 175 than 150. All right, other benefits. So this is interesting. So the first round of public comments was overwhelmingly consistent. Quantify them. Jam them into the quality and make them real. Don't just talk about them. We want to see them. So we proposed 
A lot of them. Well, first, we considered everything. A very formal MCDA, which, by the way, we had tried on two different occasions over our 10-year history. Both of them, you can imagine the Saturn V rocket on the launch pad, and it goes up about two feet and then comes right back down and kind of crashes on takeoff. It was a disaster, absolute disaster. The panels could not master it, everything, nothing was mutually exclusive. They felt like they couldn't weigh one thing versus another because it was all interrelated. So we just, you know, we thought about the step thresholds where you would kind of take some kind of approach to, you know, just, you know, lifetime burden of illness or something and kind of scale it up. We did propose this modified version. And again, with our original approach, we were going to have them vote on about 12 different things, other benefits um, and contextual issues, on a Likert scale and use that again to kind of flow back and forth between the 50 and 150. As soon as we proposed that way, at least, of quantifying them, uh, the second round of public comment said, God forbid you try to quantify these things. <laughs> Wait until there is a consensus validated approach. So we kind of, you know, anytime, and, and part of it was the people were worried about unintended consequences. Once they really started to think, oops, this isn't all an add-on. I think that was part of it. We made it clear we weren't going to take the 50 to 150 and every single new other benefit or contextual issue was going to send you north towards two or 300,000 for quality. Once they realized we were going to deal within that range, um, I think, well, we had always said that, but I think people started to, to worry about you know, the downside, if you will. So what we are going to do, and we're going to start this um, within the next couple months, our next public meeting, we are going to do a qualitative MCDA, I'm calling it. It's still very modified. We're not going to weight them. And we're shifting from a Likert scale to a dichotomous yes, no. Does the severity of this condition mean that it's somehow more important in the weighing of the quality than, you know, than other? You know, we're, we're still going to learn whether these, even if you frame it as a yes, no, or we have to leave an uncertain bucket for people. We're going to learn from the process and learn how about calibration. Learn about reliability, because the whole world is still struggling with the knowledge that cost effectiveness is not everything, but how do you weave in these other benefits? How do you weave in these other contextual issues? So we're going to hopefully be a laboratory for that over the next couple of years and be able to bring, uh, involve academics and to bring the learning back. Okay, put potential budget impact and other things in about five minutes. This is going to be quick. So first of all, this is our, our scale. I'm just going to show you, hope I have the, do I have anything that can, oh well. I'm, see the red line? Our potential budget work and the linkage to affordability has a critical assumption. It is that in the United States we do not want health care costs to vastly outstrip the growth in the national economy from here on. So if it's 18% of GDP now, we don't want to wake up two to three years and find that it's 25% of GDP. Now that's an assumption. It is based on some laws in some states that actually have caps to growth in healthcare costs and some actions are taken, even some federal legislation. But we have used that as the fundamental assumption and that's what that red line is. That's the growth in the US GDP estimated by the World Bank. Once you have that as your frame, you can then say how much are we currently spending on healthcare? What's the percent spent on drugs? Another key assumption, if we're going to give the growth to healthcare to within that overall growth target, the growth in drugs also is going to grow at that same rate proportionally. Big assumption. If you do the math beyond that, and it's all just very simple math, we came up with a budget impact threshold because we were asked by stakeholders, don't just tell us that the potential budget impact will be 500 million or 2 billion. Tell us in some way from a policy making perspective what's too much. What should we worry about? So that was our goal. We came up with that threshold. And the public comment we had received around this was all over the map. Maintain it. Eliminate it. Separate it. Get rid of any kind of warning around a threshold. Create a different uh, or additional thresholds. Use a longer time horizon. We were using five years for short-term budget impact. Use a shorter time. So the, the public comment really was splayed across the map. What we did, though, decide to do was um, shift away from um, our own assumptions around uptake, which were very, very hard and very controversial, and basically 
we did affirm the relevance of we feel still very important to link the potential budget impact threshold to growth in GDP, but we decided not to try to estimate uptake anymore ourselves. So what does that mean in practice? It means that we are now creating a graph with the price on one axis and the percent of uptake of eligible patients at five years. You can graph that 915 million per year, and you can just do what ifs. What if the price is $70? Well, that means we could treat about 7% of eligible patients before reaching that threshold. If we wanted to treat 10%, because that's what clinicians say we really want to do, we would want, if we don't want to exceed that threshold, a price around 50. We might say we have a cost-effectiveness-based price at 30 that would allow us to get closer to 25. And yes, ICER is still going to use this approach because if we have our public meeting and we ask clinicians, if you, from a clinical perspective, on a patient need basis, how many of these eligible patients within the indication should be treated? And they say a number, like 25%. And we know that the price is $50. We will then, from a policymaking perspective, want to raise a concern, an affordability, and ultimately a patient access. Because what will happen is that the insurers will figure out a way to ratchet down, and that patients won't get the drug that they need. And so there really needs to be some collaborative work around price, around maybe rationing, prioritizing patients, around getting other waste out of the system. Something has to, to, to move. Or you might decide, this year, we can blow through our budget on this one. We can just do that. All right, I've got very little time left, so I want to talk about current and future directions. And right now, ICER's work is being used by lots of insurers um, and health systems. Um, in the, there's some very interesting uh, legislative action recently in New York State that I hope you'll learn about, where the governor has passed, they've passed and signed a law that will set a Medicaid drug cost cap. If they're growing beyond that, they are going to determine a value-based price and have a lot of sticks to basically negotiate to try to get the price down to that level. So it's a very new experiment in the U.S. context that's worth your knowing about. And we've just recently announced an agreement with the Veterans Administration for them to work with us closely in figuring out how they can further integrate our results, including the cost-effectiveness results, in their formulary design and in their price negotiation. I have a case study I'm going to give you in 30 seconds, because this is the future, not this foot but what I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> this poor person has severe atopic dermatitis. This is eczema, but worse than you can imagine. You can't sleep. You can't work. It can be over lots of your body. It's very disfiguring as well. You get infections from scratching so much. The only treatment forever has been creams, steroid creams, day and night. Messy, doesn't really work very well. So a new drug has come out just this year called Dupixin. Now, Dupixent, what was expected? Well, Dupixent was the first biologic. It's an injection for patients with a great unmet need. Clinicians have been lined up around the block waiting to use this for their desperate patients. There's no competitor on the horizon. The launch price was thought to be consistent with severe psoriasis, and those drugs are around 60,000 a year. Now, there are between 350 and 400,000 million patients with, with severe atopic dermatitis in the U.S. So what was the anticipated payer reaction? Well, they were expected to grudgingly accept the manufacturer price. What else were they going to do? Well, they were then going to put on stiff coverage uh, limits through prior authorization, and they were going to wrap the increased costs into future premium growth and, and higher cost sharing. People had estimated that given that 350 to 400 really needed it, that only about 200,000 would get it, but that that times the 60,000 per year would be around $12 billion over the next few years. So what did happen? Well, this company, we always work with the manufacturers in our reviews, this company really came to us early and said we want your cost-effectiveness results as early as possible so we can factor that into our pricing. When they got that from us, they went to the payers before FDA launch, talking about their pricing in relation to the ICER thresholds and looking for some kind of give around the, the 
the kind of coverage terms. What they ended up offering was a net price to the payers of 31,000. Remember the 60,000 that it was expected? 31,000. And here's a quote from the CEO of that drug company. Sorry, well, this is from a, an article in Wired magazine. So Regeneron, this is all in the public domain, Regeneron said that it wanted to hit our lower end to come in at what was the high value end of the scoring, and they wanted to be able to tell the pharmacy benefits managers this during their negotiations. The company announced that with some negotiated rebates, the price would come in around 31000 right at the golden end of Isher's scale. The CEO said, pretty damned responsible. That was his words. Interestingly, a few months before, the CMO of Express Scripts said, I'd characterize it as a responsible price, almost the same words. He said, neither side got everything it wanted, but this has been responsible. So what will happen? The anticipated outcomes, given this arrangement of pricing and the coverage terms that were arranged, is now that 300,000 patients will gain access instead of 200,000. Greater access for patients. The cost to the system will be around $9 billion. This company will still make a lot of money. The health system will save $3 billion. So we want the future, and we expect it to be more Dupixents. We think that drug companies are going to see this as a strategic approach to value that will mark a shift in the U.S. context. And it will be good for companies, it will be good for patients, and it will be good for the health system over time. So with our growth in the future, we're actually growing. We're, as you may know, we have a kind of a virtual academic network of health economists with whom we commission cost-effectiveness models. We'll be announcing shortly some increased funding to be able to grow that network further. So we may be working with you all in the future. Look, look for that. Um, but we uh, expect within a year and a half to be able to do reports on every single new drug at or near the time of FDA approval. And we do expect that work to be used around value-based pricing and negotiation. My last slide is to tell you what value frameworks are. They are nothing more than a description of what matters, what will and won't be counted and how, and what the procedures are through which all interested parties can contribute and have their perspectives heard. That's all and that's everything. For a country that doesn't have a governmental approach, for countries that do, everybody has a value framework. And it's a big challenge because it includes not only math, but it includes ethics, it includes politics, but it's something that health economists have really been at the core of for decades. So it's a real honor for me to be able to come here and for my first IHEA meeting and be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, every, um, everybody, for coming to the session. Thanks uh, for inviting me to come and talk about uh, where next for value frameworks. Um, as some of you may know, I've just spent a year on sabbatical at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in New York. Um, and as part of that, been thinking about uh, value frameworks, being uh, 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 getting used to the US system. And uh, um, I, I, I think I want to to echo and um, um, uh, Steve's comments there. You know, it feels to me very much like the discussions we were having in the UK 20 years ago. Um, and um, certainly a motivating reason for me to go to Memorial was uh, Peter Back's um, drug abacus, which was just uh, gaining some, some traction. As Peter describes it, he never saw it as a despite what's, uh, what Dick said about where it fits in terms of plans, he never saw it as a real value framework, more as a way of getting a conversation started about drug pricing. And um, he uses this slide a lot, which uh, shows the increase in the median cost of drug, cancer drugs at their time of FDA approval over the past 40 years. And you can see a pretty nice straight line in that, and then 
he would, uh, Peter, sh Peter emphasizes that when you look at the vertical axis, it's on a, uh, uh, a logarithmic scale. So there's, there's some evidence that, uh, 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 some considerable evidence that, that drugs, particularly in the oncology space, are simply getting more and more expensive at launch, and that's causing pressure on the system. Um, as Winston Churchill once famously said, we've run out of money, now we have to think. And in a sense, I think that's kind of what's happening in, in the US. For a long time, when we were having the debates in Europe about how we prioritize healthcare, um, uh, the US's approach seemed to be, well, we've got plenty of money for healthcare, we'll just keep, keep spending. Well, I think we're seeing some of those drug prices as, as a response is unconstrained uh, demand for, for products. Um, I, think there's some I, 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 I think there's some dangers in, in what's going on at the moment in the US, particularly in, in terms of this discussion about value. Uh, we've heard you know, that there is really nothing new uh, under the sun here, we've been doing value frameworks for, for many, many years, and it's just partly that the US wants to call it something different. It's partly related, I suspect, to the fact that uh, under the Affordable Care Act, cost per quality analysis was outlawed, uh, and so people started talking about value. Um, but here's the danger. Here's, here's a concept paper, so-called, not in the peer review literature, but put out as a quasi-scientific uh, paper funded by a pharmaceutical company. Um, and I just want to show you some heat maps from the paper. In, 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 in some ways, you know, um, uh, a leg legitimate thing to do, you might imagine. You, you look at the different value frameworks. So we've got the value frameworks going across the top, and then we've got the different attributes of those value frameworks going down the side. And then there's some judgment somewhere, um, uh, methodology is not really uh, very well reported in this study, but they've made some judgment about how much emphasis on each of these attributes do each of these value frameworks uh, make. And you can see, or you may not be able to see, it's, uh, it goes all the way from the ASCO value framework, to, uh, but also covers, uh, and, and the uh, US value frameworks have been talking about, but also NICE in the UK, ICWIC in Germany, um, uh, we've got France in there and Sweden, and of course, you know, there, there, there could be others uh, that you, you might imagine should have been in here. Nevertheless, um, that's what they produced. Let me show you the other one that they looked across different um, stakeholder groups uh, uh, as well to show that they seem to value different things. Well, okay, that's good, but where's, where, where's the problem? The problem is in the conclusions of this paper. The conclusions of this paper uh, come across as nobody knows what value is. Everybody's focusing in on different things. Different stakeholders have different elements of value. How can we, as pharmaceutical companies, be held to uh, produce value-based products when nobody knows what value is? And that's, that's the danger. That's the message that's going out from, from some uh, pharmaceutical companies. Here's another, here's another worry I see on the horizon. Uh, disease-specific multi-criteria decision analyses, commercial multi-criteria decision analyses being sold as products to help plans make decisions. So this is uh, uh, from the website. Again, um, you may not be able to see all of the detail. This is, this is uh, looking at some of the newer products for familial hy hypercholesterolemia. Okay, um, you, may, you may know the PCSK9 inhibitors have come onto the market. Interestingly, uh, um, uh, I don't think Regeneron quite got the price right the first time around, which is why they may have been a little bit more uh, flexible this time around, realizing that they weren't selling much of their product. However, here's, here's a commercially produced MCDA, which, it, which seems to focus just on cardiovascular disease. And if you go to their website, you can buy MCDAs for multiple cirrhosis and, and, and various other diseases to help health plans make decisions. Um, some of you may know that uh, Zetia is a much lower price than uh, uh, Praluent or uh, Repartha, and yet the green line there, which is tantalizingly called uh, economics, 
uh, seems to play very little role in the uh, different scoring system. It's very unclear, and it's partly because you have to pay to get access to this stuff. Uh, it's very unclear what methodology is being used. But it's out there, and it apparently has a market. Um, so it's very reassuring that we've had the um, uh, second US uh, panel. I think it's uh, uh, reported last year. I think it's an important and timely update to the original panel. And indeed, in the context of value frameworks, emphasizes that, uh, yes, the US has had uh, a value framework for the last uh, uh, 20 years. That was the first US panel. And indeed, you might argue that uh, the, the, uh, this this Although it's an important update, the update really is incremental rather than fundamental. Um, uh, so many of the very important recommendations that were made are, are, are re-echoed in the second panel. Um, ultimately, the, imp the importance of this may depend on the extent to which um, the reporting standards are adopted by journals. I suspect this is, this is aimed as a somewhat more academic exercise, although importantly, is the emphasis on qualities as the legitimate metric, the continued legitimate metric for health benefits. And, you know, Steve, Steve said that very often the detractors from the quality, of which there are many, um, uh, very often are detracting from the quality without actually saying what you could use to replace it. And again, I'll come back to uh, uh, Winston Churchill, who, who once said that many f uh, 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 have made similar comments about government and democracy. Many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe, and no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it's said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. And I put it to you that we could say this very much in terms of uh, uh, qualities and cost utility analysis. Many forms of outcome have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends, even those of us who use it, nobody pretends that the quality is perfect. Uh, indeed, it's been said very often, I suspect, that cost utility analysis is the worst form of evaluation, except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. And it's interesting to me, um, um, if we think about um, the, uh, the, the white paper initiative that uh, 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 Dick just mentioned, and, and point of clarification to Dick, we seem to have lost the Ash Econ. Is that, is that something, is, has, has Ash Econ dropped out of this white paper? Because I'd understood that this was originally a collaboration. There's, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, um, but but it's, it, it seems to me um, uh, this is an extremely uh, uh, important initiative and um, we've already seen this, what, are you, what are you calling it, the value wheel or, or, or a flower? Or, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to just make a couple of points about, about this because uh, uh, you are in the feedback stage and so here's, here's some feedback. The, it's great, it's, great we do, it's great that we're continuing to see quality adjusted life years as the core of this. I, I was confused somewhat in the, uh, in the draft that's come out, is, is, uh, and, and indeed in the presentation of it that we just saw, is um, you know, not using so much the traditional economic terms of welfareism versus extra welfareism, or rather extra welfareism is a little bit absent, perhaps. Again, we went through all of these debates about whether or not extra welfareism is a better form of evaluation than welfareism, given all the problems people had implementing welfare economics in health. And it seems to me that we're still in that world. Um, this seems to be broader, and, and while keeping the focus on quality adjusted life years, bringing back in those uh, uh, broader elements that, that we put to one, perhaps put what to one side when, when cost utility analysis was being uh, conceived. Nevertheless, some of these things, I would argue, uh, are actually already and should already be captured. For me, the reduction in uncertainty, clearly. I mean, you know, all of the work that's been done around value of information analysis emphasizes that uh, you can capture uh, uh, the cost of uncertainty is part of value of information. 
But what, what worries me, and it really does worry me, when people start talking about the value of hope, because that is so obviously one of those things, as Steve said it very well, is that people can focus in on these extra things, and when you put the spotlight on that thing, it seems very important until you start actually trying to bring it into the framework. So let me give you an example. You've, you've, you've highlighted here reduction uncertainty is important. And yet, in the same breath, almost, we heard that actually patients are prepared to pay $35,000 for a standard deviation increase in outcomes. Wait a moment. Reduction in uncertainty is that we would be prepared to pay to reduce uncertainty in outcomes. Let me give you a practical example. You wrote a paper that pre pre uh, 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 dated this effort, Lou, on companion diagnostics. That also had a very similar value flower in it, and it also had reduction in uncertainty and the value of hope. So when we do our companion diagnostics analysis and we show that we can identify that small tail of people who benefit from immuno-oncologics, do we have to take $35,000 off of all of the other people who have now lost hope because we've come up with an efficient test in order to um, say who it is should be treated. Seems to me it's those sorts of practical elements about how you would apply this that are actually going to, you, we're going to see some of the wheels fall off of, of, of these things when you actually come to try and apply it. So it's very easy for people to say, oh yes, this should be included, this should be included, this should be included. But the how, I think, might actually give some of us some pause for thought. Um, during my time at MSK, we've been trying to, I've, I've um, uh, some of you may find this amusing, but I've stepped into the world of qualitative research. Um, and we've started, we've uh, started by just doing some focus groups, talking to cancer patients and uh, physicians and nurses, convenient sample at, the, uh, uh, at MSK, by, so by no means representative, but asking them what's important. And you see the sorts of things that people, are, uh, uh, those, those groups have been telling us are important. And of course, actually, unsurprisingly, efficacy is right up uh, the top there. Side effects, quality of life. So lots of the things that are already captured in our, in our frameworks. One of the interesting things about the ASCO framework, again, it, it, it puzzles me that it's described as a something for you know, again, in the, in the, in the white paper, something that's uh, uh, described as being for the physician-patient uh, interaction, but actually what it does is take all of the elements that you might want to discuss with patients and use physician weights to jam them all together in a net clinical benefit. Um, to me, it seems that Peter's tool, the drug abacus, which is described as being for plan level, actually lets people set their own weights. So in many ways, is a much better way of sitting down and doing shared decision making. Uh, um, some reflections on MCDA for HTA. I mean, you know, if we look back into the history of using MCDA, it was designed to help committees make decisions. And S Steve, again, made some... Uh, uh, comments about the practical challenges of even using it in, in that context. The, the, we've had a lot of discussion at these sorts of meetings uh, about the extension to uh, HTA and the use of it. You know, before we were talking about value frameworks, we were talking about MCDA for HTA, and of course they're all the same thing. Um, it seems intuitive, but the devil is in the detail, and the danger is there are people out there using these methods without economics training um, uh, and without careful consideration of the independence of the criteria and that the scoring should involve sacrifice, and ASCO needs to learn that lesson, right? You don't just add up points, uh, because that implies some kind of trade-off that you probably never intended to make. Economists, of course, already use a particular form of MCDA, and again, has been over the, over the past years, has been a very important part of these sorts of conferences, and that's discrete choice experiments, which uh, m many of us in the room have probably uh, used over the years. Um, I wanted to flag up this nice editorial uh, by Alec Morton in uh, 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 
value and health. And, and he just also gives some warnings about MCDA. Um, and he proposes two tests for MCDA models. The treacle test, which is, can a, a winning intervention be completely ineffective? And the smallpox test, can a winning intervention uh, be for a disease that no one suffers from? It's, and this is the danger of MCDA, is that actually you can start to have these other attributes actually outweigh the fact that uh, the intervention doesn't work. And I really worry when I see value of hope. Uh, that's what I worry about. I worry that value of hope isn't going to pass the treacle test, that you're going to add in this element that means just because people hope it works doesn't mean it actually works. Um, so I've just got two slides left. Don't worry, Lou. Uh, um, so principles for value frameworks, that I think they should be uh, generic and not disease specific. I, I agree with what's been, you know, and it's, and it's pleasing to see the US panel and ISA and uh, uh, the white paper all coming into line and saying, you know what, it should be based around qualities. Qualities are the, still the best that we've got. We should think about, and we are trying to, many of us are trying to think about how we value um, attributes beyond the health attributes. Uh, but the principle, it seems to me, should be that we should be prepared to give up health. Uh, if we want to add into those other things, to, to Steve's point about uh, the opportunity cost. People, people say they value things until you make them realize there's an opportunity cost. Uh, a very quick ane anecdote, which is I was talking to a colleague who does a lot of discrete choice experiments at uh, the MDM conference last year, was presenting a paper where he'd worked with cancer patients and, and had used uh, progression-free survival as a metric. Uh, in order to value various uh, other attributes that patients said they valued. Uh, he presented these results and at the end I said, well, the problem is, what does progression-free survival really mean? Why didn't you do this with overall survival? He said, well, we tried it with overall survival and uh, none of the patients would trade. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, that tells you something about value. And so, of course, we should, if we're going to use MCDA, we should pay careful uh, attention to treacle and smallpox tests. So where do I think next for value frameworks? I think it's great that the US panel, uh, that the uh, uh, white paper from ISPOR and ASH Econ are aligned. It's great that uh, ISA is making such moves uh, uh, in this area. Value is in the health economist's purview. Could a broader concept of value reignite the welfareist, extra welfareist debate? It might do, but we need to be careful that that doesn't become counterproductive with the economists infighting about which approach to use. So it's, it's good to see Mark Pauly on the uh, uh, suggesting qualities. That's great. Um, um, the problem and the danger, as I see it, and the reason for the call to arms is that many emerging value frameworks do not involve economists and do not conform to our notion of value. So we have to, take, we have to align within uh, um, uh, these sorts of uh, conferences and then go out into the broader uh, space where people, where it's the Wild West and people are doing whatever they uh, feel is appropriate. And I'm, I've, I thought I'd try and be a convert controversial at the end and say we need to engage with this value quackery. I think there are many physicians who would very, very strongly uh, suggest that as economists we're not, we shouldn't be practicing medicine. I was going to suggest that there's many, uh, many, despite the very many well-trained physicians who have engaged with economics, um, there's a certain amount of value quackery out there as well uh, that, that, that's in the medical field and not in the economics literature. Thank you. Fifteen minutes. We're going to set up some chairs here in a second.
Okay, we only have 15 minutes, so I'll be quick about it. Uh, please identify yourself and ask your question. Yeah, um, Adrian Taus. Um, as a co-author of, of some of the flower papers, I just wanted to, to pick up a couple <laughs> of points that Andy um, very um, um, forcefully made. So, and of course you're right, but I think you're, uh, love the love of you, you're not right. So the uncertainty point, absolutely risk neutral payer, it's catch, captured in value of information. What we're talking about here is the value to a patient of having information that potentially reduces, enables them um, to do more about their lives. And the obvious example is the work Peter Newman did. People will pay for a test that tells them whether or not they've got a disease that's incurable. So, so it's really a, so it's a different component. You can argue about whether that's a reasonable thing to include, but it is a conceptually different point. And again, the thing about hope, which we're not, it's not hope per se, we're talking about a distribution that suggests there's a tail. And there's a small group of people who are, who are getting effect, let's say for the sake of argument, a cure. Now, almost certainly there, you know, we should be able to better identify what the attributes of those people are, but let's suppose we can't at the moment. So I think that's... But if um, we do, do we have to take away, away the value of hope from the people who have now lost hope? Be, well, for me, you would, because that's not what we're talking... You know, in a sense, it's a different issue. You've, you know, you're... But I think the crit critical point you were also making, which I have pondered about, is what point are we moving from risk aversion, risk neutrality, to being risk loving? And it may be we do actually move in those ways at different points in our disease. So partly to answer your question on that one, Adrian, I'd refer to some work by uh, Kahneman Tversky. And if you dig back to one of the latter chapters of Thinking Fast and Slow, you see that it's pretty nonlinear. The, the valuation is pretty nonlinear with the uncertainty. So on one end, people are anxious to buy a lottery ticket. On the other end, people are risk averse to that small chance of failure, so they'll insure against it. And, and that's where some of this valuation difference comes in that, that you're talking about. It's, it's on one end, it's buying yeah, a lottery I'm ticket. Not I'm not, I would be foolish to try and argue against uh, Kahneman and Tversky in this audience. <laughs> um, and that wasn't the intention, my, my, but, but it's a, a, my legitimate, uh, which I still think is a legitimate point, is if we come up with a companion diagnostic which identifies that tail, does that mean that we have to take value away from the people who we're now telling? You know, we're sorry, but... I think no. my final comment, because others want to, I mean, I think it's a perfectly legitimate point, and indeed, I think it was, I think it was Joe Coast, I can't remember, somebody wrote a paper about the value of ignorance, and I, you know, which is, which is fair enough, so we, we, oh, we don't have that in our value framework, I accept that. <laughs> so just your other point, sort of buried in the details of our talking about MCDA, is that any of these elements, addition of them, needs to be vetted with stakeholders so that there's an understanding and agreement of what's happening when you do that. Um, but I, I guess I would also say that I wouldn't completely, you're right about some of the things that come out in these different value frameworks as being maybe not very well, you know, aligned with what we think of as health economists. On the other hand, I would also say we don't want to ignore what people are saying out there either. I don't think it's all one way or the other. It's not all right. I don't necessarily think it's all quackery either. I think we have to listen and, and try to interpret what people are telling us. Yeah, I would just add that um, we have the technical appendix. We have a technical appendix to Section 3 written by Darius Lakdawalla primarily, but we all other contributors. But, and it does, it does try to derive these elements from a welfare economics perspective. So there are some subtleties in each of these that, you know, that aren't really captured in the label. So I would recommend that section to you. He also has a paper in the Journal of Public Finance, I think, that on um, Journal of uh, Pub yeah. Public Economics on, on this insurance value, which was a really a key thing, and maybe the biggest component, which is the value of financial risk protection, which is what is part of the extended uh, cost effectiveness analysis that has been used in global health. But to that, he adds the value of physical risk protection, and has a very interesting uh, comment recently in Health Affairs in a blog about uh, kind of we might want to have a higher threshold for rare catastrophic conditions because of the extreme financial risk, financial risk impact and health risk impact, which means, and maybe we'll come back to this, but let's take these questions and come back and ask Steve about their debate around rarity and so on. So. 
Afshin Ganjur, Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. Uh, I would like to comment uh, that it's important to stress the underlying values of the analysis. So if most experts put emphasis first on cost utility analysis, it means that the underlying value is a utilitarian one. And this is important to stress because you also value frameworks which were produced by doctors, which obviously start from medical ethics values. So principles such as beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, for example, plays a large role. And there are also autonomy-based conceptions which uh, make suggestions for resource allocation in healthcare, which do not start from a uh, cost utility framework. Also, it's important to stress the uh, underlying assumptions made for the additional value components. So let's start with the value of insurance. Basically, on the one hand, you assume that the people are fully informed. So you have the principle of the economic man behind this. On the other hand, you say you basically assume that uh, because of the value of insurance, they do not take up risky behaviors because if you feel more, you have more assurance, you may actually take up risky behavior. And uh, again, you assume uh, the economic man rational. On the other hand, for the value and hope, uh, you assume that people might overvalue small probabilities, which is not in line with uh, uh, expected utility theory. So it violates the assumptions of the economic man. And also you make underlying assumptions if you include spillover effects that uh, people who have larger families count more than with small families. Okay. Do you have any comments? Well, just, well, I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, a cost utility framework is implicitly and explicitly a utilitarian approach. And there are plenty of people who feel like that's why we, why it's, it's both important to consider and why it never fully captures everything about the way we think about health and the way we use resources. On the other hand, much like Andy's slides, it's hard to imagine a better alternative as the anchor to lead a public discussion. You know, you could imagine that there would be one in which you would prioritize children under the age of 10 no matter what. I mean, you know, there are some societies where they would pour no matter, you know, resources, no matter what, for some kind of principle towards either their elderly who are worshipped or they're young. Um, in our Western societies, it has seemed that utilitarian basis has been the anchor, and yet we know that both for heuristic reasons and for ethical reasons, there will always be reason to make that part of a broader social discussion. So I would uh, like to counter-argue, uh, you say Western societies, but it's literally speaking, uh, Anglo-American societies, so societies that have a Calvinistic background. So, for example, if you look at continental Europe, other values count more, for example, Kentian values based on uh, the theory of Immanuel Kant. So it's a controversial. Right? Then this also plays a role then in the frameworks you're using. So I understand it's a, you're valuing US-based frameworks, and it's fine uh, to apply utilitarian framework, but you have, I think you have to be explicit about this. I think we are. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Alex Jones from Oxford Policy Management. Um, I felt that all the presentations thought about value as, um, as created individually by, uh, by individual interventions rather than created by a set of interventions within a system. Um, so assuming the independence of interventions to, to the other interventions that are available in the system. And th this has been actually a recurring theme at a number of the presentations at this conference. And I just wanted to ask, is this, is this something that we're happy with as an industry? Um, you know, the, the two frameworks presented here structurally bring this in, that we're going to think about interventions individually and assess their value individually and, and come back to it and reassess it individually. Um, I, I don't know how you would think about it at a system level, but the two frameworks we have to... In the US, surely we have the most data available. This, if, if anywhere we could think about a, the whole system and value at a system level, it could be in somewhere with a lot of data like the US. Um, so it's just your, your, your impression on whether this is an important consideration or, and are we happy thinking about in, interventions individually like this? Thank you. Well, I think a lot of us would say it's a starting point. You know. It's a practical starting point because interventions often come on in discrete ways and we have to make decisions. But 
absolutely, ideally, we'd be identifying, we'd be evaluating clinical pathways, and we're starting to think about that more. It's a lot tougher, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. So I, I agree with you basically that we are, we are not, we should not be limited to evaluating one intervention at a time. I mean, from our, from our work, we, we do topics that are very system level oriented. So for instance, we've done reviews on integrating behavioral health care into primary care, um, outpatient palliative care programs, um, community, using community health workers. So major shifts in the way that healthcare is organized. Um, we, ha we could do it for different ways of ensuring, you know, you know d people through on one exchange or another. But the, the limitation is, is, is interesting. The limitation is very hard to get qualities in any way out of some of these system level changes. It, so the outcomes that you use end up being, you can do cost consequences. It's just very hard to do a true cost utility analysis on a system level change, at least in our experience. And I can also tell you just from the US perspective, if you talk to real health system leaders, at least in the current environment, cost effectiveness to them means something better for equal or lower costs. They almost never today are looking to spend more money on a system level. It's almost like a, 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 to get into the card game, you have to have a card that says this will be less expensive and, and then maybe it gets you something better. So it, it's a different view of, of the world of value and cost effectiveness. It's only around drugs, devices, things that are kind of external that are coming in one at a time that we actually think in general about adding costs and is it worth it? I think there, are, there have been some, there has been some work around complex interventions, so um, where, where you've got a number of things coming together. So I agree with you, it's a little undeveloped compared to say looking at drugs or devices, uh, but there are some people thinking about that and, and, and trying to come up with quality type outcomes or, or other outcomes for complex interventions. We have a couple of minutes, so quick, quick uh, Thanks, David Kim from Tufts Medical Center. So thanks for a great session, and I have uh, questions that I think the ongoing value framework really focused on the find out what matters to the decision makers or patients, so defining basically attribute of those value. But the real challenge is coming out when you're trying to measure and quantify those attributes of value. And one of the particular challenges associated with the uncertainty around the estimate. For example, treatment efficacy is a matter most to the probably all of the stakeholders and patients, but efficacy itself has uh, actually uncertain. We can take the mean value, but there's uncertainty around it. So as a consequence, is the estimate of value also uncertain? It's just not just mean value. ICER is around like $100,000. There's uncertainty around this. So how does uh, ISOPR, we can use the value information uh, framework, but how the ISOPR value assessment and ICER framework actually try to incorporate those uh, uncertainty around value estimate? Thank you. All right. So uh, it's a great point. We do it in several ways. One is when we're looking just at the comparative clinical effectiveness, at least, the uncertainty there is captured in a separate rating we give that links the magnitude of the net health benefit with an estimate of the certainty, and we have a letter rating. So that stands almost like a, an initial starting point for our independent panels when they start to look at our cost effectiveness results. And we do all the usual, you know, tornado diagrams and cost effectiveness acceptability curves. Um, Every once in a while, though, we do have a tough time messaging. We have had times when we have judged the evidence inadequate to distinguish the clinical effectiveness of two drugs. But modelers want to use a point estimate based on the best data, and there's always going to be some difference in that point estimate. And you spin that out through time, and you'll get a different ICER. So then we're left saying, well, the cost effectiveness looks different but we're really telling you that we don't have a lot of confidence in the difference, at least in clinical effectiveness. So that it is difficult for lay people to kind of grasp, but over time, we're, I think our, our committees understand that, and we're trying to continue to work on how we message it to the broader public. Anybody want to add One more question, thank you. Um, thank you very much. My name is Jeffrey Hodge from the University of California at Davis. Love the session. Really briefly, it made me super happy to hear that we should begin and build upon CEA when we're looking at 
um, value. That made me super happy because I'm in that business. However, I wondered, when you journey out into the real world, uh, Andy and Steve, when you look at NICE in the UK, you look at ICER in the US, do you think it is the optimal strategy to begin with and build on cost effectiveness analysis, or is it perhaps better to use more palatable words? It, is that a terminology question? So it's a, a, a strategy. Strategy. The, the, I, I think in the US, it, it, we're already seeing it, uh, that uh, uh, strategically, it's not a good thing to start talking about the quality because um, uh, that seems to put people's uh, uh, backs up. So, um, but I think we need to we need to have a measure of health. And my point about the quality was it seems to be better than any other measure that anyone's come up with. I'm very fond of uh, a statistical quote uh, um, that, that is, uh, you know, all models are wrong and some are useful. And the quality is a model, after all, of health. It's not meant to be all-encompassing. And there are times that we should leave the quality alone and move to uh, other, other forms of evaluation. And it may be that actually there's, there should be more of a horses for courses type argument where sometimes cost-benefit analysis may have a very reasonable place. I don't think that's for catastrophic things that people don't have a lot of experience with, but I think there's a lot, there are many health conditions where people understand the health condition very, very much, that, that where we could use cost-benefit analysis more. Um, I think that's probably all I've got time for. A final word from Steve and sure. Dick, if you'd like. So. so Right now, the U.S. public is, is fully engaged with drug prices and costs for, in a way that they have never been before. They still, if you ask a focus group, they think of value as how much did it cost to make that pill and how much profit is the drug company making? And is that fair? So that's, va that, that's the way that they intuitively think. And the trick is, Part of the tricky part is that a lot of what's been in the headlines have been generic prices that have been jacked up. And we wouldn't use ICER's approach to judge the appropriate price for a generic in the market after it's been out there for 20 years. So we, you know, we do have a lot of, of, of messaging issues. Now the quality, you know, ICER has developed multiple layers of, of information. Obviously quality is at the base of a lot of what we do. But we have a lot of discussion material that talk about added benefit for patients, you know, improving patient lives. I often say the quality, unfortunate, it's a very unfortunate term, it really is. It should have been MIPL, a measure of improvement in patient lives. <laughs> Sounds too much like nipple, but we can work on that. <laughs> so, so we do have a messaging, and the word quality for some patient groups equals if you measure quality, it means you ration care. It means you discriminate against the disabled. It means that you're against old people. So there are some trigger points that we're working on, but I will, having been doing this for well over a decade now in the US, we have come, even with the public, and certainly with patient advocacy groups, much further than I actually thought we would. So I think, um, even though it's still a difficult road ahead, I think, and again, this is a, a, a job that we all share, we have to figure out how to talk to the public in a way that they will understand and that they can grapple with fairly. And just to, for our part, um, I'd like to reflect on a little tension that occurred in the special task force and gets back to your point, Andy, about extra welfareism and welfareism. Is to what extent are we trying to, uh, to maximize health gain across society and to what extent are we trying to understand what a, a real demand curve for health would look like and think about willingness to pay. And that's a real tension in the U.S. that we, I think we just have to be very understanding of. It's not quite the same thing. And as we think about value and the stakeholders and how we're interpreting it, those are two things that are operative. And we're not going to solve it completely, but we've got to be very conscious of it. Again, I'd like to urge you to uh, download our second draft report and send your comments. And uh, please thank our panelists for a great discussion, and thank you.